I'm pleased to introduce the program tonight. Um, I'm going to um, uh, introduce our moderator, Tom Griscom, who will then take charge. Um, there are many things I could say about Tom Griscom, particularly his illustrious career in communications, but I'll focus briefly on a couple of things associated with the university. In 2007, Tom was named the Distinguished Alumnus of UTC. And he has been so involved in uh, many activities at UTC, including serving on the UC Foundation, the UTC Chancellor's Roundtable, and the UT Development Council. I'm pleased to welcome him, and he will uh, start with our guest tonight. Tom? Well, thank you, Verby. Uh, sitting up here on the stage is 30 years' worth of chancellors. Uh, and you can take that for whatever you think it means, but, <laughs> but here's 30 what 30 years' worth of chancellors looks like. Uh, I want to start on, the, on my far left because we have one person, Fred O'Bear, who liked it so much he came back for a second shot. So he's a double <laughs> dipper. He's a double dipper. Uh, <laughs> And uh, Fred was here from 1981 through 1997, and then came back in 04 and 05. Uh, <clears throat> Bill Stacy, who was the chancellor here from 97 to 04, and then went to Baylor School as headmaster. And of course, Roger Brown, who is now the current chancellor, who's been here since 05. I mentioned earlier that it was kind of interesting that we have chancellors who come here. Now, Roger's still in the, in the seat at this point, but both Fred and Bill came to Chattanooga from outside of Chattanooga and decided that this is where they wanted to stay. So that has to say something not only about this university, but also about this community. Uh, and so we're glad that you all came here and then chose to stay here. Uh, with that, let's jump right into it. I told him this is great. This is the first thing I've done after 100 days working with Governor Haslam. And so I'm rested and tanned and ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> So just get ready. <laughs> and we'll start with an easy one. And, and what I thought we'd do is just sort of toss these out, and all of you can answer them, or one of you, and I may come back with follow, but let's pick up and begin with the merger of the University of Chattanooga and the University of Tennessee. That issue still is out there today. I mean, we are resolving, or hopefully resolving, the issue involving the UC Foundation and its role with the broader University of Tennessee system. That's a bill in the legislature right now. But at what point do we finally either decide or give up on the fact that the University of Chattanooga, which is now the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, is part of a university system in the state of Tennessee? Fred, because you saw this after Jim Drennan, who came here, and you picked it up, and clearly, I think after Jim Drennan, there was a little more push from Knoxville to sort of say, maybe we need to look at this camp a little bit harder. So how do we deal with that issue? Well, it's a, a very interesting point because uh, I thought he was going to start with me and because I was here at the time of the merger, but I want to clear <laughs> that up. I was not here at the time of no, the merger. I was, so. though. I was, I was George, he was. I was he George was. Connor's student assistant at the time um, of the merger right. and watched it outside the, his office window as the campus police here at the university iced down the hill to keep the protesters from screaming at Buford Ellington and Andy Hope. <laughs> so, well, well I, when I moved here in 1981, I moved here from the state of Michigan, which prides itself in having a what it calls a non-system of higher education. Uh, each campus is independent. Uh, there are some institutions that uh, even to this day serve as branch campuses. Dearborn and Flint for the University of Michigan, but by and large they are uh, 13 or 14 independent autonomous campuses. And when I moved here to become part of the first system that I had ever worked in, uh, I was a little uh, concerned about how much autonomy I would have and how much independence and whether or not there would be a lot of control from Knoxville. And I think uh, I was pleasantly surprised uh, although some people in the audience may be surprised to hear this as well, that uh, Ed Bowling, who was president at that time, did give us uh, degrees of freedom down here to move in directions that we wanted to move in, that we had elected to move in as a campus. And I think that 
the role of the chancellor in, in establishing those relationships is really to convince the system leadership and the other components of the university system that as each campus grows and develops, the whole system is benefited by that. It's not taking away from another part of the system for Chattanooga to grow and develop. And I think once that understanding is reached, then each campus can decide for itself what its destiny will be and, and move along those lines. And I think that was one of the uh, one of the forms of energy that I expended was trying to sell that story up the road 120 miles. Bill, you got anything to add to that uh, merger story? Um, I, I like the sense that uh, we have such a document and that there was a thoughtful process uh, sort of way back when that went into it. Um, I share uh, Dr. Robert's uh, experience uh, I just was thinking as, as he talked, I don't recall a president at the uh, system uh, calling me on the phone and coming down to say, stop that. You cannot go there. You can't do that. I really had several times a challenge to, are you big enough? You think they're strong enough? Have you got the resources? Can you continue? Um, but uh, those who, who know me well will have a sense of saying, maybe they're surprised to hear me say that that the support out of the system uh, was pretty good. Uh, there were uh, maybe things I didn't ask. I, I had a failing, I think, along the way of not asking big enough. Maybe that was it. Uh, the one thing I, I guess I see in the difference of that multiversity, which is seated in Knoxville, 25 or 30,000 and all of those faculty and the great research load that they carry, uh, the great research mission that they carry, uh, and I always suspected that we didn't have that uh, pure research mission. As wonderful as it would be to cure cancer, uh, I, I don't think we have 50% of our faculty in pursuit of, of that. It's going to happen one day, but uh, maybe not at Chattanooga. So I, I see us somewhat more rifle shop as a, as a university, uh, not demeaning one inch any program that we have, uh, as the first doctorate came along for us at some practical time, I think they were uh, saying in the agreement, uh, I, I tried to ask our faculty to shift those doctorates into an applied application focus so that the brains would go immediately into something that we were using and not the postponed delayed gratification of pure research. Uh, so there's some differences, I think, in the, in the Chattanooga campus and the multiversity uh, at, at Knoxville. It didn't make us one whit any less uh, as a university, and I was proud of it as it went through. And I like to see those uh, uh, coming uh, steps uh, uh, for Chattanooga's university as well as in place out in Tennessee. Well, I arrived uh, 36 years after the Treaty of Chattanooga. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and how many presidents ago? And, how if many you, <laughs> and, if you can, and if you can think of it that way, that's the length of time between the War of 1812 and the Mexican-American War. <laughs> and, and that's probably an apt analogy. Yeah. Uh, I have heard many metaphors since I've been here about the relationship between UTC and UT. And some of them can be mentioned in a light public. <laughs> uh, but but I think one that, that you do hear that has a little bit of validity is the family. And, and, and for most of us, we've had the experience that members of the family are not always happy with each other, <laughs> nor all, or are we always happy with the limits that we place on each other. But I will, I will say that I think that we have arrived at, a, at an equilibrium in the system, thanks to my predecessors who are truly distinguished that people in, in the UT system and people across the state of Tennessee know that Chattanooga is not just a very remarkable city, but I truly believe that more and more they know that we have a remarkable university with its own strengths and its own uh, application to, to the students and the needs here. Uh, I, I agree with both of uh, Fred and Bill that the way we need to succeed in the UT system and in the state of Tennessee higher education is to be excellent at what we do. Not to claim rights from 41 years ago in a document, 
but to show by performance and, and excellence that we deserve what we have and more. So I, I really think we have to focus on how we demonstrate our value to the state of Tennessee and to the UT system, and that then, I believe, uh, the, the, the rewards and the fruits will come our way. Well, is part of that maybe becoming the premier undergraduate university in this state, mm -hmm. which I think UT, that to me is what UTC was always about, is a teaching university. And everybody still talks about it. <clears throat> but it, it means if Knoxville's got the research, but could this be the premier undergraduate university? Doesn't mean you don't do master's programs at sure. where people really come and know they're going to get a strong, strong education. And does that fit? Tom, I would add to, yes, I think it does fit, but I think um, I would add to it by saying that um, we have the unique metropolitan mission as well. One of the things we were asked to do in the early 80s was to define the mission for this campus. Uh, we were members at that time of the Association of Urban Universities, which was a national education group going out of existence. And a group of campuses, uh, UNC Charlotte, uh, Young's, uh, not Youngstown, um, uh, Wright State University in Ohio, and others got together with UTC being a, a founding member of this and created the Association of Metropolitan Universities, arguing that although we are located in an urban setting, we serve a student clientele uh, and in a public service way, a community clientele that goes beyond the boundaries of the city of Chattanooga. We serve a metropolitan region. So I think that undergraduate focus, emphasis, I'm sorry, emphasis with the metropolitan focus is uh, an appropriate niche for us to, to operate in. And as Roger said, to try to do the best job we know how to do. Yeah, I, I was... Uh, um, I, I came to the conclusion that the, the school was there. Uh, the, the faculty at UTC is a strong, really good faculty who care about teaching. And I think the richness of that interaction in the classrooms and lab at UTC is really good, has been a long time. Um, I, I think then the question for a skeptic in uh, Nashville uh, hearing is to say, well, what's the proof that your students do well or do better uh, based on this rich environment of commitment to teaching? Uh, I believe the evidence uh, is there that the uh, outcomes for students are, are measurably good. Um, but I like the notion of saying uh, you, you have to find in the university those avenues that are truly full of, of excellence, as the chancellor mentioned. Um, but I found that in so many places that the excellence was here. Uh, if there was one thing that uh, uh, Chattanooga, uh, I think, just is light years away uh, in front, it's frankly its foundation. It is that merger agreement of a few million put away, a few million carefully watched, invested, grown. Uh, I love what Richard Brown has done sometime between my leaving and now the chancellor being here. We went from an it that was about an extra hundred million dollars. And I think Richard has worked it from being a liability to most of it coming to an <laughs> asset these days. <laughs> this was the first year that the dormitories, for instance, wow. produced more investment back in the university's academic programming than its very highly valued endowments. Well, that's unique among schools like ours to have the community so so vested, I mean, we've got university professors all over this audience, Gary professorships everywhere. Uh, that's a pretty unique opportunity for a public university, an engaged metropolitan, urban, uh, civic, uh, and to say that the, the foundations that are not university related, Benwood, you know, the, the Lindhurst, you just go on and on to say, my goodness, where did that come? So in, in the hard times, uh, that Fred and I now have handed uh, to Roger Brown. We've said uh, we were we played chancellor when we had money. Now you try to uh, see uh, when, when you can do that. So, uh, but those resources are terrific, and they've allowed us to become to do some things in the classroom and in our mission of interaction of students and faculty members and students and deans and staff that I think have made us better. 
I'm so glad that he has acknowledged what I say to my wife every day. I do not have an easy life. <laughs> By the way, I must say to this audience, distinguished supporters, uh, my wife sends her deep regrets that she can't be here tonight. She's in California with our daughter, and it was a time that she had to squeeze in now or wait for a long, long time. So please forgive her being absent, and she sends her very, very best regards. And if I can pick up quickly on your last question, Tom, uh, I, I com completely have committed to the metropolitan mission that these two gentlemen uh, set up and, uh, and gave credibility and legitimacy. What I think going forward to make us that paramount undergraduate institution you mentioned, in my mind, we still have two missions. It's a bimodal mission. We're serving a state and a region of a state that is severely undereducated. Some of you in the audience know what I'm talking about. I have visited high schools in neighboring counties where fewer than 10% of the high school graduates from the previous year enrolled in any college. Now that is part of our mission and our challenge, to prepare students to enter a progressive economy, a viable economy that is really beginning to take off again in the Chattanooga region, some of whom are not well prepared. And I think part of our mission is to take those students and do the best we can, along with our resources in the community college system, uh, to prepare them to be contributing members and how happy and healthy members of, of the society. And then at the other end of the continuum, a program that so many people in this audience have, have corresponded with me about frequently, and that is our honors program. And, and the Brock Scholarships, uh, they, they are, the Brock Scholars are among the brightest students I've ever seen anywhere. Those students could succeed anywhere you planted them. What we want to do, and part of our new uh, long-term plan, is to expand the Brock uh, Scholarship, not to, not to dilute it in any way, but to make it an honors college. And that honors college would represent about 10% of our undergraduate population, whereas today it represents 1%. We need to recruit very actively, aggressively, and wisely to bring the very best students in, let them lift up the academic uh, stature of the entire institution. At the same time, we're working hard to give this underpinning to a population of our state that that desperately needs education to, to be economically viable. You all used the term an engaged metropolitan university. Uh, and part of, you know, from the, from the planning session that you just completed was the difficulty in defining what does that mean? And I like to ask each, all three of you because you've used it, you still talk about it, but in, from your perspective, when you were sitting in that chair, you're in there now, what does it mean when you reach out to somebody in this community and say, UTC is engaged in Metropolitan University. What should they be doing? What should they be thinking? What are you asking them to engage in uh, in support of this university when you say it? Are we going to keep this going in the same order? <laughs> Whatever you want to do. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd forget. Do you, do you want some yeah. time to Wait, prepare for yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll throw out a, 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 a quick answer that is part of the Metropolitan University concept uh, and the engaged concept as well. And that is, um, you know, I think about the most recent book about us is called Light Upon a Hill. And it talks about this uh, almost in kind of an ivory tower image. Yeah. That is not, not what we are. Uh, we are. We are a campus that does not end at the edge of the campus property. We go beyond the physical site that we're on and work in the community with various partnerships and cooperative activities with all sorts of community agencies, whether they be public schools or museums or uh, businesses or, you know, you name it, whatever uh, is out there that can be connected to the academic 
program offerings on the campus in ways that offer internships and field experiences for students. Um, activities of that kind seem to me to define the engagement of this campus. Uh, Bill or Roger talked earlier, Bill talked earlier about the applied focus in the research dimension as well. And that's another element of this, to talk, uh, to talk about uh, not the kind of pure PhD in history that might be offered at two or three other campuses in, in Tennessee, but to pick and choose our points of emphasis so that they really do connect with community issues, community problems, community agencies, and community people. Before you, Bill, please, let me, I want to pick up one. But do, do you think it's significant when those apartments came up and you forced this university across from Crawley Avenue and you finally broke down what you said, Fred, because you're right. There was this notion that this university was had this boundary around it that you never went out of. But that move across Macaulay, in my mind, sort of sent a different signal. Is that a fair Those statement? Open, yeah, yeah it, it was a big, big thing. And, and I recall a big mouth saying to a group of folks one time in the Martin Luther King gathering in that community, we will not come unless invited. And I think Richard Brown and some of my colleagues said, you talk too much, don't go there. <laughs> but that's what we had to say to the community. And it wasn't just the people who lived in the community had to hear that. I think the rest of the city won the flow. And my goodness, the city then did all sorts of things. Uh, we used to laugh and, and say, uh, John Chair, we gave him the memorial sewer, I think, down on <laughs> right. 9th Street. And we had uh, we, the, the streets were better, and, and the wonderful uh, Lindhurst selection and creation of home opportunities, uh, people just building on their own and so on. So it, it made a difference. But I, I love to hear that the university has uh, Brock Scholars, and, and we've got to keep that. Part of our multi-university is that we've got to do everything in an excellent way. It has to have that sort of results. And so, yes, our scholars need to head off and make LSAT scores and MedCats and so on that knock the tops out. And we go into the profession, that we go into a, a, a life of academia, very comfortable. So, yes, I, I want that. But you know, there's a funny piece of me. I also like the fact that we help mud flats for U.S. Express, yes, mm -hmm. and we right. decrease the fuel consumption of that truck line so that it's more viable. Now, that's an applied metropolitan. We are teaching. We're taking something out of the engineering school and putting it in their lab. Well, it's the same for making carpets. We go to Costco, and we teach them a little bit about some piece of machinery that runs this way instead of that way. And we've got those rocket scientists who are helping, but we also have those musicians who help with our symphony. We also have the painters and the artists who help with the Hunter Museum. Our faculty needs to be everywhere and, and truly engaged with their own expertise. The nicest public service I used to look for among faculty dossiers as they came for promotion was service. And what I, I liked most about service was seeing the brightest faculty member in his or her discipline on the planet, giving it away. Now that's engaging. Yes. You can't hear me? Oh. Well, you're not the one making noise, are you? No, it wasn't me. You all thought it was, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> well, Let's we can hear him up here, let me tell you that. <laughs> Everybody, come on up right. here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, let me move to a different question. Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, I had prepared for that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you come back in a minute. Let's talk about growth. Uh, there are some of us in this audience who saw our tuition drop from like $1,000 down to a couple hundred after the merger. And then all of a sudden we saw a campus that maybe had 1,400 students start growing to 2,000 to now to where you're over 10. Right. So is 10 the right number? Uh, did we grow too fast? Did we grow in a way that we lost some of the things that you all have already talked about that made this university special? Uh, how important is it to have 10,000 students versus, say, a couple thousand and all the other things that were part of the University of Chattanooga? Let's reverse the order, and let me just talk for a minute about the uh, about the 
the current budget. It's a tricky, tricky balance that you're talking about, Tom. We have uh, depended upon an influx of enrollment growth. And, and I don't mean to say that crassly, that we, that we opened the floodgates and, and, and let students in because we have not done that. Our, our ACT scores have gone up every single year. But we were cushioned against the worst of this recent recession by the fact that we still were having some revenue growth from a tuition. Uh, however, there is in my mind uh, a philosophical issue that you've raised that it won't be my job to, to solve, but, but somebody pretty soon, with the help of everybody in this room tonight, needs to ask themselves, what is the right size for the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga? Because it's a different place at 25,000 students. It's just not the same. Now, that may be where we want to be, and it may be where the city demands that we go. Some of you know that I taught at the University of North Carolina at Sharp. I arrived there when the enrollment was almost exactly the same as it is here at UTC now. It currently is 25,000 students and is a Research One university with a full uh, panoply of PhD programs. And the reason is the city demanded it. The city's growth and the city's complexity, particularly in the financial industries, absolutely demanded it. Somebody's going to have to decide for the city of Chattanooga what university do we need and what do we deserve and what will its qualities be. I really love the fact that we are a, a choice from the largest of our universities in the state, like Knoxville and MTSU. I think we also offer that, that patina of having been a private school and that we still pride ourselves on the fact that we hope that some of you who are UC alumni, that we're trying to preserve the tradition and, and the excellence that you brought here. And, and, and we really we, we, we want to preserve that. Thank you, Tim. So, so that's my, my first take at your question. Bill? Well, I, I think the sense of, of the focus the chancellor is right. He does have to wrestle with uh, how big uh, shall it be. Uh, one of the biggest things that all of you know, I, I was the luckiest uh, chancellor in the whole bunch uh, because I had these two great phone calls in my life. I had a phone call one day when I first got in here, and it, I was at a meeting up at Knoxville, and we were in, I was in a meeting, and Sue was upstairs uh, resting a bit because we had something she had to go through that evening. And the phone rang, and it was the Mr. Lupton. And he said, where is Bill Stacy?" And she said, he's in a meeting. And she, he said, I want to speak to him. And she said, he's in a meeting, and he'll be there, I guess, until lunch. She, he said, you haven't called me in five minutes. And so she came down and knocked on the door and pulled me out of the meeting and said, I, I guess you ought to call him. And so I called then, Mr. Lupton, <laughs> and he said, what do you and Ruth Holmberg want with me? And I said, oh, well, I, I want to meet you. And Ruth knows you. She was going to introduce me. And he said, well, what do you want with me? And I said, well, I'd like to meet you, and I want to talk about some things. No, no, no. He said, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the time that we got new chairs and new couches and uh, in the library, and that's the time we went from the card system to the, to the technology. Mm -hmm. So that was his first call. That second call was a call that I was speaking to the local delegation uh, down to Mountain City Club, and he said, come down. And I said, but I have a speech to make. I'm talking to the local delegation, and he said, I will wait for you. And I went ahead and made my little talk to the delegation and then went down to his office, and he and Jack Murrow were sitting there, obviously waiting and fidgeting until I got there. And then at the time he said to me, would 25 million be enough to transform your university? Wow. <laughs> well, <laughs> that kind of says what the university town expects us to be. Right. The, the transformation he saw had something to do with how big you ought to be. I want it carefully planned. I don't want to do it. I won't tell you. I don't know what it ought to be. But you've got the brains on that campus. And so on that first day, first Monday of September in 2001, we had a magnificent little thing out uh, in front of the, the Patton Chapel to say to the faculty, you got $25 million to figure out how to transform us. What do we want to be? All the things that we've been hoping to do, 
that it was a matter of some money to do. We now have some resources that are fabulous. So I think about uh, the, the chancellor's sort of very wise ear to the ground to say, our community matters to us as a university, uh, maybe more than most places I've ever been, that the university town cares about us. And uh, they want very much to <laughs> tell you uh, what they'd like uh, to be done with their university. And I think we ought to invite that because it has played well for this university. Mm -hmm. I have no magic number for you, Tom, if that's what you're looking for. Uh, you know, 7, 8, 9 was good in the 80s. And 9, 10, 11 is good now. And, uh, um, but I think the, the point has probably already been made here that what we need to do is, as we grow and as we change, that we still hold on to those things in our heritage that make us different from other institutions of similar, similar size and maybe similar uh, program uh, choices and, and things of that kind. Because I, I think it is the fact, we used to use the phrase, a, pub, uh, a private education at public school prices. Now I know you paid some of the private school prices up there first, but there was, it took 14 years from the time of the merger for the tuition to get back to where it was at the, at, in 1969. Uh, we spent a lot of time in the 80s and 90s trying to make sure that this campus was to do some of the things these fellows have been talking about, affordable and accessible, as well as when students got here, accommodating uh, and accountable. We talked about the four A's here a long time, uh, but I think uh, we need to do is to make sure that that private school heritage where there is close student-faculty interaction, where the faculty really care about the full development of the students, uh, where uh, there is now an affordable, although less so each year, I understand the tuition going up here, but uh, we need to make sure that that heritage is still a part of the UTC experience. It is the UC part of UTC that really makes us different. Yeah. And it continues with those, those faculty who were here at the time of the merger helped recruit faculty who followed them. And one of the things they looked for were those characteristics that made this a significant student-centered uh, institution prior to the merger and I would submit to you, and I hope students in the audience would agree, that it continues to be that today. I want to pick up your point, though, because the question about how large you become right. may have a new consequence when you look at the complete college act. Right. Because as you keep growing, your money now is going to be assessed for your campus based on retention and completion rate, a four-year degree. So. You've got to be careful, I would think, as you look at the size issue, is can you make sure that you can get these kids through this, through this process and get them out at the back end with some type of degree? Otherwise, you get penalized by the state one more time. Is that? It's uh, absolutely true. And I think, you know, I consider it a moral obligation, Tom, that, that, that we not admit more students than we can serve at the top of, of our ability. So uh, we're, we're going to see uh, more reliance upon public fundraising, excuse me, private fundraising, as you know. Uh, unfortunately for our student president and past president who's sitting here with me, there's going to be more reliance on tuition. Uh, it, it has happened across the country. It will, it will continue here. I hope we can keep it slow and manageable. But at no point may we, I think, outgrow the ability to serve the students that we admit. We must be able to provide, provide them with the best possible programs and the best possible supports and a living environment as we are now uh, a traditional residential campus. So uh, I do think we have to pay close attention. Now, uh, everybody keeps referring to Richard Brown because he's, he's got a balance in his books, but, but uh, it's, a real, it's a real conundrum how fast you let students come in, 
if you're not getting the dollars to support them to be successful. Bill, there's, there's, I want to I jump in because there's one distinction you have that your other two colleagues do not have at this point at least. There's one more sitting here who might decide to do it yet. You looked at the whole system and said, I might want to be present. Yeah. And you put your name in there. And can you share with us, as you made that decision, you and Sue talked about it, what pushed you to say, yeah, I'd like to, to have done that. We, we, we all know sort of the, what's happened since you put your name in. Uh, but as you went through that, what did you hope to be able to do if you had been selected as the president of the whole university system? Uh, basically, what we know is it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, well, it, are you talking about yourself or what? Yeah, yeah, they, they, <laughs> my candidacy, my raising my hand, it didn't work. I, I, I just have to say to you, and, and it may sound schmaltz, but what the heck, I can afford it now, is that I, I, I grew to love Tennessee, and we just uh, get spoiled, bluntly, living in Chattanooga, seeing what the community responds to this to this university. Uh, I'm sure the chancellor has seen it and felt it already, and certainly Fred handed it to me. I think one of the things Fred specifically did in, in his uh, chancellorship here was bring the town and gown together to bring folks to, to UTC to say it's still yours, come and get it and tell us what you think we ought to do with it and so on. Um, and, and I got very frankly bitten by that. I, I had been in Missouri, I'd been in California, I had been in Illinois, I had not seen a place that would respond as well to the university and then I said, well, heck, I'm the chancellor, so I guess they're responding to me as well. So I had, I had, I had this spoiling of, of people doing great things. Uh, and I began to say, well, that's what the university system might need. And I'd be one little uh, crass here to say, and some of the outsiders that we've tried to teach how to be a University of Tennessee president didn't make it, so I'm going to try. I want to try to suggest, uh, I've been here, you've seen warts and all, and, and I can be taught. Uh, I, I love the governors, I, I love the senators and the representatives because they care about Tennessee and if I could get a legislative agenda over there, or frankly if I could say to Senator Crutchfield, please give me the engineering building, we need it for accreditation, the, pe the people are going to withdraw accreditation of engineering because we promised them that we'd get a new building any day now. And we got a show cause order saying, you got to show us why we don't take it engineering accreditation away from you. And I was delighted to sit in Senator Crutchfield's office and have him take me up and down the hall saying, you got to get it in that building. They need that building in Chattanooga. Well, so why did I try it? I, I saw the people respond well to their university, the version I knew in Chattanooga. I saw legislators respond well. I saw accrediting agencies. I saw the graduate schools responding. And so I just had this sense that says, well, if it works this Splendidly, if it's this much fun in Chattanooga, guess what it would be if I could take that same sort of an energy to Nashville, Memphis, Clarksville, Knoxville. So that's what prompted that. Uh, I won't say that, that there was some encouragement uh, from folks who said, uh, we got to have a Tennessee in this time, wonder where there is one. So there was part of that with, that was involved with it. But it really was this sense of, my goodness, uh, people in Chattanooga really respond well to their university and hold it up. So, Fred, we're going to come back to you now. See, we let you take a couple rounds when you didn't have to go first. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> I can tell. So, here it is. Uh, as you look back at your time as chancellor on this campus, what was the toughest decision that you had to make? Well, that's interesting. The, the real daily hard ones have to do with Richard Brown and all those <laughs> sorts of things. You know, we, well, remember, you we, said we you lean on him. <laughs> Um, I think one that was festering for a while, and I decided that after I announced in September that I was going to uh, stop being chancellor the following the, the next summer, June, July, August uh, here, that one thing I could hand to the new chancellor was a change in the mascot for this campus. I bet you didn't think I was going to say it. <laughs> we had been 
burdened with Chief Makanuga and the NCAA and the Indian community and a number of others were on our backs about making that change. And I thought, what in my last year can I do that if it explodes, you know, what can they do to me? I've already announced it. I put together the most, the largest and most complex committee that I have ever assembled. It had to have been 20 plus people. And it was chaired by Tom Losh, who was out here in the audience. Yes, he is. Tom was on our staff at that time. And he, uh, in a magnificent way, and in, I guess in retrospect, in a miraculous way, was able to take that very diverse group of individuals and get them to come around to coming up with three different mascots, uh, recommending three different ones to me. I can't remember all three of them, but the, the obvious one from that committee was to go with a mockingbird, which was the state bird in Tennessee. Nobody else had it. It allowed us to keep the mock's name, and it's a bird with an attitude. So, uh, you know, that's, and, and uh, we were able to uh, move that issue off the table and I said, welcome, Bill Stacey. Let <laughs> me tell you, he, he did a wonderful job. Thank you very much. But I, he just made me remember that I came to work on a Friday. And uh, at 8 a.m., I went into your office, and Buddy Green was there. He was the football coach acting athletic director. And Buddy Green said to me, uh, you have a real problem, Chancellor. And I said, I just got here. How did I know? He said, your basketball coach has resigned. And so the, the sports were still kind of important in those days uh, to, to this place. And so if you could have just kept that sweet 16 basketball coach for one more month, that might have been a good thing. Well, there's a guy up, there's a guy up in Knoxville looking for a job. <laughs> <laughs> now, this may, but you're still here, Roger, but uh, can you talk about something to date? Because uh, you didn't inherit this one. I know, I've, what, I know I, I, which, what they're talking about here. I have thought a lot, as, as my <laughs> colleagues have talked about this, and, and, and I have it. The very most difficult decision is still ahead of me. <laughs> 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 well, Perfect. Uh, unfortunately, maybe right. <laughs> <laughs> I will. To, to, all kidding aside, uh, Many, many people here uh, saw me go through this in my very first fall on campus. And it was a tragic situation of the allegation of sexual abuse by athletes. And it was, it was heart-wrenching for the students, for the parents, for the victim, but for me and for many supporters of our athletics program who were not sure I had done the right thing. And, and one, one doesn't know, but I, that because it involved the lives of students and something that could follow them potentially forever, so I would have to say that was, that was the hardest situation. And, uh, I'm, I'm just hopeful that everybody concerned as well. So, so I'm going to stay with you. <clears throat> if you look at Bill Stacy as his successor. Even though Fred was sort of in an interim here, oh, yeah. but uh, what did you ask coming in saying, I got this question about being chancellor of Mississippi University, let me ask you this, can you help me think this through? Was there something you asked? You know, how many of you have heard about the three envelopes in the desk? <laughs> <laughs> Predecessors. Uh, Fred and Ruth uh, were, were here in the job and welcomed Carolyn and me with open arms and, and became our tour guides to the city. And Ruth reminded me the other night, she said to me, I don't know what you think right now, but you will love the city and you will never want to leave. You're right. You're right. Uh, the, I, don't, I don't remember asking a specific thing of Dr. Stacy. Uh, I was, of course, Terribly, terribly jealous of the Lupton gift. <laughs> and <laughs> so I did ask, and he did attempt. Uh, he did his mighty to see whether uh, 
I could spend some time with Mr. Lupton, but by that time, Mr. Lupton is not, not accepting new new visitors. Uh, but but what but what I really have to stress here is that I have had the absolute best of both worlds with my predecessor. Now, I, I grew up as a faculty member on the campus of UNC Charlotte, and every single acting president and chancellor in its history still lived on campus. Everyone <laughs> is still there in his office uh, and her office. The founder was a woman. That is not always optimal. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Can I take you 120 miles up the road? Oh, yeah, right. No, no, it, it, absolutely. <laughs> but, but I said this to these gentlemen in private, and I have to say it in public. They both have been supremely supportive, absolutely at my disposal for advice whenever I wanted it, and never one day has meddled or second-guessed me as far as I'm aware since I've been here. I'm really great. As Bill said the other night, you, you deserve it. You do right. deserve it. Yeah. So, Fred, yeah. did you give some advice to Bill Stacy as he came in here as your successor? I left some letters in the desk. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, no, I think each of uh, Bill probably. Uh, well, I know he did this for me. Actually, you know, it's like being your own grandfather. I, I'm his predecessor, but I'm also his successor. So it's kind of kind of weird here. And I must tell you a story that the first day I came back as interim chancellor into the old office that I had been in for many years before that, I opened the. There was a note on the top that said, "Open the middle drawer of the desk." And I was thinking of the three letter story about, you know, call your predecessor. But um, I opened it up and quickly closed it, hoping nobody was around because there was a small bottle of Maker's Mark <laughs> in the desk. And Bill said, You're going to need this from time to time. Yeah. Where did you hide my bottle? <laughs> I was supposed to leave it for you. <laughs> Keep looking, it's in there. <laughs> But I think what each of us did was leave for our successors a kind of unfinished business list and, right. and, a, and a history of issues that were still open issues at that time. I think that's fairly, fairly typical during a transition of the kinds that we were talking about here. And it is. And, I, you know, there were, there were, there were issues of, of concern and there were unfinished business items that were works in progress but that hadn't been you know, the, the I's hadn't been dotted and the T's had not been crossed. Uh, and I think each of us uh, took the time to uh, bring bring up to speed the person coming in at that time. And that's very helpful. Bill, before we go to any questions that may be in the audience, let me ask this to you. When somebody comes up and says, Dr. Stacy, you were chancellor at UTC, what does this university stand for? What do you want them to hear? You. I want them to hear the applied excellence that the university has the ability to have a faculty who's thinking. And my wife always reminds me that it is the faculty of the university and the current administration. Yeah. The faculty lasts through all of us, mm -hmm. and what they're about is creating and discovering information. I want them to apply it and put it to the good use of the citizens of Tennessee. And Fred, has that progressed from Chancellor number one, when you're here number one, not when you Right. For what Bill just said, there would you have had a different statement? No, not at all. I think the phrase that we were using in the late 80s and into the 90s was um, what we wanted to try to try to do each year was to grow in both quality and responsiveness. And I think those were the two issues. We tried to increase the quality of the student body, uh, expand the faculty strength at the institution. Uh, increase retention rates, increase graduation rates, and as you pointed out earlier, that's going to become even more important in the future here as funding may be shifting over to that that dimension. But I think it was those two issues, quality on the one hand. We wanted to make sure that next year we were a higher quality institution than we were 
the year before, and secondly, that we were more responsive in that out year than we were prior. Now, these, these uh -oh. came from Verbi. Now, and I'm not going to tell you, this sounds like it came from Richard, but it doesn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, t I'll read the question to you, okay? <laughs> okay? It says, besides money and finances, what do you see as the greatest challenges for UTC in the coming decade? Well, I think it's, it's, it's the same thing that we've all experienced all along, and that is to, to keep the, the community that we serve in, in strong support of us, and and that means that we have to we have to, to perform in such a way that they believe we are worthy of their support. And I, and I think that you have to do all those things we've talked about here tonight in order to earn and and keep that support. So uh, we 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 have to. And and another thing we have to do, and you and I've talked about this, is we have to tell our story really really well, so that. Things that we're doing, I and mean, we do absolutely unbelievable things every day, we need everybody here to hear about it. And uh, we need to do a better job of making sure you do. This is a little toss up. Uh, what do you see as the role of athletics in a university setting? My sense is athletics is one of many, it's part of that multiversity. Uh, we do uh, anything that we set out to do, we do well. And if it is to have a great university center and food operations, we say that's as important as any of the other items. Now you say, is that more important than having a great uh, philosophy department? We'd say, no, our, our central mission is all academics, but any program that we offer to the students ought to be the best we can offer. Right. Uh, I, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's kind of front window or front door. Right. Uh, activity. Uh, it's something that uh, alumni typically rally around. It's something that is part of our community service activities. I think we need to emphasize cultural uh, and educational events as well as athletic events, but it is, it is, as Bill says, one of the several choices, but it's one that has a payback for the institution uh, in terms of, of um, uh, building a supportive uh, uh, community for this campus uh, that uh, is in many respects unlike others. Uh, I used to joke about the fact that uh, uh, if you're hiring a new football coach or basket men's or women's basketball coach, the trustees sometimes are more interested in that than if you're hiring a provost for the university. <laughs> uh, that, that isn't the way it should be. I mean, they, there should be interest in all of those uh, vacancies and how they are filled. Uh, but it is the reason it is that other way is because of the the publicity that surrounds an athletics act, uh, program and activity. So uh, it's there. Uh, it's something colleges and universities do in this country. I'm, I'm interested to see how many of them are adding sports. We also just saw in our conference that. Greensboro is dropping wrestling, which is too bad for our for our wrestling program here because it, it eliminates the automatic qualifier for the NCAA tournament. You have to have a certain number of, of institutions in your conference doing that sport. But uh, if you look at the total national picture, there are more people adding athletics than they are taking it away. So there must be something there that's worth talking about. And I would just add briefly that, that student athletes are just terrific kids. I enjoy them so much. And uh, they, they, they are the students who get up at 5.30 in the morning for practice and who still have to carry a full load. They have to carry a full load to keep their scholarship. And then they come back to practice at 5 o'clock instead of 7.30 or 8. It's time management. It's leadership skills. Uh, it's And the other thing about our level, as you very well know, Tom, we, we don't make money in athletics. <laughs> And to paraphrase the NCAA ad, we have a whole lot of student athletes who are going to go pro in something else. <laughs> but, but they still love the game. And, and, and I think it's a part of the entire college experience that I would not want to see going on. Now, I'm going to make a disclaimer on this one so you know I didn't write this because I'm on the Board of Regents now. But here's the question. 
you think that this university would have been better if it had been part of the Board of Regents to the University of Tennessee system? No. No. <laughs> and the decision is still out there, as you know, Tom, that people are talking about, should they be somehow recombined? But I, I really like the fact that we're a small system. And, and uh, it, the, the other system is difficult to get your hands around. It's difficult to govern it. You're learning. So uh, I, I like where we are. The other system at the time we came along, it was clearer that the University of Tennessee was the research engine of the state. Then there came a law school, a medical school, on different parts of it, and somewhat, I guess, maybe confused the issue of where is the pure research and where is it not. But, uh, I think at the time we had uh, a consideration of which Alliance, which board of trustees or regents, uh, I thought it was right to go with the University of Tennessee. And, and I may be wrong, but I'm not sure the Board of Regents was even established at the time that the University of Tennessee merged with UT. I think it came later because a lot of those schools were part of the Department of Education right. in the state of Tennessee. Right. And I think the Board of yeah. Regents came into being sometime 72 or 73, right. if I remember right. And uh, the Regents <laughs> institutions were largely the former teachers college, oh, not only in this state, but in other states as yeah, well. Exactly. And although teacher education has always been a significant part of the program offerings at UT, at UC, uh, UC did not begin as a teacher's college. Right. Here's one that clearly had, was something that has stood out for this university. And, and Bill, I think you probably sort of pushed these numbers up when you were chancellor. And it's what has been the role of diversity in the young UTC? I, mean, I think it's still right that this university has the highest uh, percentage of diversity of any university within the state. Yeah. And, and, and I would say that the, that the faculty and staff here took that on as part of the urban mission uh, to say we serve all of Tennesseans. Uh, we serve uh, particularly those who live in an urban environment. Most Tennesseans live in a city, live in a big population area, and uh, diversity is simply something that we recognize that's part of the richness of Tennessee. We were under the uh, <clears throat> Geyer uh, federal court order in the 80s and 90s, and very proudly, this campus was the first campus in the state of Tennessee to meet all five desegregation goals. Uh, in a single year, yeah, that was uh, a great we, we stepped up yeah, first like and and yeah. proudly yeah. Uh, did we do that. Yeah, I'm very proud of it, Tom, and I and I I firmly believe that the student prospers best and and profits most in in, in a learning environment that clo most closely resembles the world he or she will inherit, and it has to be a diverse world. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, on that, let me thank the three chancellors for helping us sort of celebrate the 125th year of this university and through all participation tonight and for your great answers. Thank may you may I have one last word? Yes, here? sir. And then they allowed, all this had last word. But my observation was seeing Professor Connor over there that he would have been pleased tonight that it took three chancellors to do what one professor could do. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're right, but I'll add one other. He would yeah. also be pleased because everybody up here is in a coat and a tie. Oh. <laughs> right. Uh, I wanted to say that you absolutely rival William F. Buckley. No. no. <laughs> All you needed was a little cigarette. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. My last comment is tagged on to Bill's because uh, I knew George Connor really well. We were close friends, and uh, he not only would have thought that about the three for one, but he would have said it. <laughs> <laughs> may, may, may I thank this distinguished audience yeah. for being yes. here tonight. Thank you so thank very much. In honor of UTC's 125th anniversary, the Connor Society wants each of you to take a copy of George Connor's Living with the Word home with you. If you already have a copy, then please give a copy to a friend or a neighbor. It's Chattanooga's Urban Metropolitan University, and aren't we lucky? Thank you for coming tonight. <laughs>